church while sitting in the sanctuary, you may want to think of a praise verse, praise, praise or doxology, a personal doxology of sorts, if you will. Paul had more than 10 of such praise phrases or doxologies where he would end a chapter of his epistle with. One of them can be found in Romans 11 verse 6. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. The Old Testament too has quite a number of them excluding the Psalms. For the Psalms itself is said to contain 80% of all the praises in the Bible. And here's one from 1 Chronicles 16, verse 34. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. A doxology helps to align and stir our hearts and minds towards God who is the Almighty, and give Him the due praise and glory. It's also a way of submitting to the Most High, the limitation of our finite minds, to Him whose ways and thoughts are so much higher than ours. I have come up with a doxology of my own, which goes like this. To the Most High, the hope of my life be glory and honour forever. And I could substitute hope with either love or joy, depending on the situation. Finally, a doxology helps to prepare us for worship.
A very good morning, church. Welcome to the house of the Lord. You know, when two or three are gathered in His name, our God is here. Amen. Amen. Are you ready to meet Him this morning? Let's rise uh, to the call to the worship. We will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With our mouth, we will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. We, we declare, declare that, that your steadfast your love is established, established forever. forever. Your, your faithfulness, faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Let us praise praise, praise the, Lord. the Lord. Amen. <laughs> To the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, His love endures forever. The life that's been reborn is love and yours forever. Sing praise, sing praise. We sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong. God is with us forever. The rising to the setting sun is love and yours forever. By the grace of God, we will carry on. It's love and yours forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise, sing praise, forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever, forever God is faithful, forever God is strong. Forever God is with us forever forever we sing it out to the Lord forever God is faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us forever we sing it out to the Lord forever forever God is faithful forever God is strong Forever God is with us forever. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us forever. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us forever, forever. Oh yes, Lord, forever. You are faithful and forever you are with us, Father. We ask the Lord to open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. 
open the eyes of my heart, Lord. And open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. 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 I want to see you, Lord, this morning. Want to see you. I want to see you. Lord, we sing a hymn of praise to you this morning. For your love is good and endures forever. To the Most High, the hope, the joy, the love of our life, be glory and honor forever. Oh, we want to see you, Lord, right now. Open our eyes that we might have a glimpse of you. We just want to see you for who you are, the great and awesome God who is in our midst right now. As we worship, may the praises from our lips resonate within us so that our whole being is attuned to your holy presence. We will hold on to you, Lord. Yes, we will hold on to you. Our hope and joy. We will wait for you, our promised keeper. We will bow to you, Lord, our redeemer. For you, O Lord, our God, the one and only who came for us when no one else cared about us. And you will do and bring to completion what you have already done on the cross for us. For you are love, Lord, the God who so loved us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son Whosoever believes Will not perish They shall have eternal life We sing it out for God For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son Whosoever believes will not perish They shall have eternal life I shall hold shall hold to God alone for His love has salvaged me for His love has set me free for God so love for God so love the world he gave His only Son Whosoever believes Will not perish They shall have eternal life I shall wait Church, let's sing it out to the Lord 
great the love that carries us to kindness. Wonderful, wonderful, you're wonderful. So here I bow to live you high, Jesus, be glorified. In for all my life, I am yours forever. Yours, we sing it out. God here, God here, and now be lifted high, right here, and now be glorified. God of heaven and of God who brought me back to life, I am yours forever. Yours, God here, God here, and now be lifted high, right here and now be glorified. God of me back to life I am yours forever yours so here I bow to live you high Jesus be glorified in all things for all my life I am yours forever yours so here I bow so here I bow to lift you high we lift you high Jesus be glorified, be glorified in all things, in all things. for all my life for all Father, who can we run to apart from running to you, the God of mercy? Who else can we kneel before but before your throne of grace? This morning as we continue our worship, let us just empty our hearts and let God create a true clean heart in us. As we approach Him, we approach Him with a contrite heart and with a heart that is clean. So let us take a seat right now as we prepare our hearts to come before our God. If our hearts right now are filled with lots of burden and lots of worries, just cast it upon the Lord. Just place your burden at the feet of our Lord Jesus. Or maybe this morning you just feel there are anger in your heart. Ask God for peace. You may feel troubled. Go to Him and He'll give you rest. Psalm 103 says that, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. 
Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your inequity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, and who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the angels, like the eagles. Father, this morning we want to praise your holy name for all the love and gift of salvation you have showered upon us. We want to thank you for your mercy and grace even though we do not deserve them. We thank you, Lord, for your reconciliation plan for us so that we can come back to you once again, forgiven and renewed. We praise you for healing us, not only physically, but also spiritually. And Lord, you nourish our souls. And we are indeed grateful to you for pulling us out of our deepest pits when we are in our darkest hours. We give thanks to you, Lord, for remaining steadfast in your love and faithfulness towards us. And we also want to thank you, Lord, for renewing our strengths when we are weak. For, Lord, you have made us a new creation. You have given us a new, new identity as sons and daughters of God. So, therefore, Lord, help us to see things from a new perspective, from your kingdom perspective, and to do things, Lord, that honours you, and your mighty name. Father, we may be living in a world that is conflicting against your teaching, and very often we give in to our own flesh. But Lord, we ask that, Lord, you clothe us with your spiritual armour, Constantly guard us, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We pray that, Lord, you will cover us under your wings, your mighty wings, and protect us from the evil schemes, lies and distortion of truth that's going on around the world right now. Father, we want to turn our prayers right now to the world around us. For there are just too many things that are happening around the world which is putting the world in great danger right now. In urgency, Lord, we pray for global warming, for the storms, earthquakes, escalating temperatures. Sometimes, Lord, we may have even gotten used to. But, Lord, we just want to pray, Lord, nations will come together to prioritize their time and resources to make a firm resolution around this. We want to pray also for the wars that are not stopping around. Ukraine and Russia, Israel and Hamas. So many lives of civilians and young children have been sacrificed because of all this human violence and self-centeredness. Lord, we want to ask for you to send peace to these nations. We also pray for escalating threats coming from advancing technologies 
cyber crimes, misinformation, fake news, online scams that have caused many to suffer. We pray also for the rising cost of living that is now actually causing so many people to find it hard to continue living, to make their ends meet. Families struggling to bring food to the table. Because of that, they are just causing so many divisions within the families. So Lord, we truly want to uphold all these people and all these families, Lord, in our prayer as we intercede for them, for the less fortunate ones. As a disciple-making church, Lord, we also want to constantly be reminding ourselves and we also want to ask, Lord, that you strengthen us in the following ways, Lord. We pray for act of kindness to one another. Help us to love the unlovables and to be kind with our words and our actions. Help us, Lord, to be patient so that, Lord, we will be slow to anger and quick to forgive. Grant us a heart that is teachable so we are willing to open ourselves to the Holy Spirit to teach us and to counsel us. We pray for humility, Lord, so that we won't be blinded by pride and self-righteousness. And also, Lord, we pray for obedience, something we are struggling to do. We pray that we will know when to surrender to you and when to trust you and to know that you are in total control. And also, Lord, we pray even in a, in a world that is full of hopelessness, Lord, we can continue to stay courageous, hopeful, and joyful, knowing that, Lord, you are faithful and in all things we can trust in you. This morning, Lord, we also want to pray and intercede for those around us. Those of us who are now feeling so tired and weary. Those of us who are suffering burnouts. Lord, we pray that, Lord, you will renew us, you will restore us, and you will give us strength. For those of us who are sick, who are feeling pains, in parts of our bodies, the pain that just won't go away, the sickness that is just too stubborn to go away. Lord, we ask for your healing hands to be upon us so that, Lord, we will experience your power, your mercy, and your grace. And for those of us among us here today who are trapped in the vicious cycles of depression, anxieties, fears, and even sins. Lord, we ask that, Lord, you release us from this bondage, and Lord, you will set us free. We ask for the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ to continue to cover us, and we continue to stay under your wings of protection. So, Lord, we offer you thanksgiving, Lord, and our praise to you. We thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace. We thank you, Lord, for your assurance of our salvation and our future. And also, Lord, we want to thank you and, our, and end our prayer with the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive us those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, church. A very good morning to all of you. And before we go to our family concerns this morning, can I have a show of hands of those who are here for the very first time? Just wave your hands. If you are here the very first time. Yes, we have a brother sitting behind. Do join us after this service. We have a community lunch downstairs at the atrium. Right. Anybody else who has been here like second time? Oh, yes. No. Welcome back. Okay, before we go to our church announcement, maybe you would like to just stand up and extend your greetings to one another. Okay, shall we go to the first slide for our announcement? This is young adults, so for those of you who are still wondering what's the age for young adults, is 35 and below, right? We don't have that many here, but anyway. Uh, young adults are having a discipleship session on 29th of September as their bi-weekly meeting, right, to learn about biblical perspectives relevant to their phase of life, right? So this particular one is very interesting because it will be focusing on relationship, boyfriend and girlfriend relationship. Um, so we do encourage you to sign up for this, for this uh, event. And for those of you who want to know a bit more, you can approach Gretel. Gretel is our young adult coordinator right, for Agape. All right. So it, it will be happening on the 29th of September, 1.45 to 4 p.m., training room 8. Next slide. This is WSCS uh, arranged workshop. You know, as, as we pray just now, we are praying for lots of things going on, going on around the world, which is giving us a lot of anxiety and stress. So this session comes in very handy, right? You'll be actually uh, trained by Dr. Jeannie Chu, right? So uh, you'll be focused about uh, focusing on things like such as, uh, you know, our anxieties, our negative thoughts, patterns, how to cope with our daily lives, and practice our Christian meditation, right? So this will be a very, very meaningful and useful session for those of us who are feeling anxious and feeling even maybe to a degree of depressed in, in our daily lives. Right? So do join and sign up. This will happen on 28th of September, just for information, 1 to 5 p.m. And our last slide, baptism. Right, so we are approaching year end. So typically, you know, year end in December, right, we'll have baptism uh, and, and membership uh, reception as well. So, but before that, we do have baptism for infant and also adult. All right, so parents of infant, please do take note. There'll be a baptism class on the 7th, 14th, and 21st of December. Uh, sorry, that's for adult baptism. baptism. And for infant, you'll be only one day, which is on the 1st of December, right? So all the uh, timings and dates are there. So do register with Elaine, Elaine if, if you are interested to get either your children to be baptized or yourself. And thereafter, it'll be followed by, you know, baptism and membership reception, you know, on the uh, 22nd of December. All right, so do sign up and pray about it. Okay, so that's about it for, for, for our announcement today. I'll pass the time to Pastor Ming Li. Let us pray as we prepare ourselves for the offering. Father, as we worship you now with our gifts, grant us again grateful hearts. 
we may give, remembering how you care for us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may come forward if you have offering to bring here or the QR code. Let's stand for the doxology. Scripture for reading for today will be 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 to 21. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 to 21. Let us pray before we read. Father, speak your truths to us, that we may know that the words in this passage are not just words, but they have life. They guide us, they empower us. Help us then, Lord, as we read, to understand, and in understanding, to believe as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who might live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he, was made, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Years ago, I ministered to a doctor who was suffering from dementia. I had known this doctor before his dementia hit him. He was real gentlemanly, wonderful, kindly, respectable, respective, respectable and res respectful doctor. His patients spoke very well of him. He was a really wonderful person. But as his dementia came over him, he lost his power to control his impulse. Basically, he lost impulse control. 
And what then I began to witness was something that was really bizarre and horrifying. One day as he was lying in hospital, I visited him. And there he was, lying there and unable to greet me because he had forgotten what I looked like. But as a nurse came towards him to nurse him, he started groping her, his hands were all over her body. Thankfully, this nurse was very experienced and she kindly and calmly pushed him away. But the poor wife was totally embarrassed. Then she turned to me and said, I'm sorry, but my husband has lost all impulse control. He does whatever he likes and no one is able to stop him. It was a very... It was something that was um, sobering to me. It was a very sobering thought. Because as I thought about it, what happens to me when I lose my impulse control as well? What happens to each of us if we lose our impulse control? What will we be like? Will we really be like what you see, this whole mask of holiness, of goodness? Would I be mean? Would I, my temper be explosive if I could not control myself? What is my true self? What am I like inside when my mask is removed and I can no longer put on a mask to show myself as a good and godly and gentlemanly person? It was a very sobering thought because for all of us too, we are controlled by a lot of guardrails that tell us this is illegal, this is disrespectful, this is unrespectable. This will make you ashamed. This will lead you to condemnation. And we are surrounded then by or we have surrounded ourselves with all these guardrails that tell us, don't do this, don't do that. But inside us, when no one is looking, when no one knows what is happening inside our minds and inside our hearts, what are we really like? Are we really gentle, kind, generous, loving people? Or are we deep inside, mean, ill-tempered, rageful, filthy, a whole lot of things a cesspool of sin that is working inside us, that is just kept inside because of the guardrails around us. Is there really hope for transformation? Can we really say that we have been transformed so that even when the guardrails have been taken away, we are what we look like. We are who we are. And I ask myself this then, is there real motivation for a change? Ourselves? Can our lives really be transformed? Or are we just conforming to certain guardrails that hold us in place so that people will not laugh at us, people will not judge or condemn us? But deep inside is still a cesspool of sin that rages inside us. Today's passage then tells us about a real transformation. A transformation that does not, is not just caused by guardrails, but a real change in our inner being. The first thing then, uh, the first slide, is what is our motivation? First of all, the motivation is that the love of Christ controls us, and that's in verse 14. The love of, it is the love of Christ that controls us, that helps us, that guides us as to what to do, that guides our lives. And this begins by first acknowledging that we have died that each of us is dead. In verse 14, it says, Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. The beginning of a change in life is to recognize that we are destructive beings, that we are dead in very real ways. It is only in recognizing our death that we can then live, and we live then out of gratitude, out of love, Christ. What does all of this mean? What Paul was saying in this passage is that all of us are actually dead. We are dead to goodness. We are dead to God. We are dead to any sort of kindness. That the only reason why we look good is because of the guardrails around us. But deep inside us, we are dead. And the first thing then we need to do is to acknowledge this death, this destructiveness within us. Sometimes we hate to think about it, we hate to stop and acknowledge or admit that we are awful people. As someone said, and I've said this twice already, that we are cesspool of sin. 
But until we recognize this and until we call out to God to help us, there cannot be real change. I was, I had a raging hot temper. Even as a pastor, one of the biggest struggles I had was a raging temper. And one of the things that triggered me was my daughter playing the piano badly. <clears throat> she was not a great pianist. She, when she was five years old, she, started, she would learn the piano. And she would play so badly and I'd come and I wouldn't hit her. I wasn't that abusive. But I was abusive in my words. I was abusive in action. I would slam the books on the table. I would slam the books on the floor and say, what rubbish is this? Why are you playing like this? And then one day, I saw her cowering in the corner as I flew into my rage, my tantrums. As I screamed at her, I saw her just cowering in the corner. And suddenly it struck her that I was killing her. But it was my death, my deadness that was causing all this pain in her life. I went to God and I prayed, and this time it wasn't just God help me change. It was a desperate plea that said, God, I am dead, let me die. Because as long as I lived with a rage like this, I would be destroying lives, I would be destroying my daughter, I would be destroying other people, other people that I love. That this rage was causing so much hurt, so much pain. And then I had a vision. That was while I was still awake. I saw myself climbing up the cross where Jesus was hanging and I climbed up the cross and I stuck to Jesus and I said, God, that's the only way I can live. Because unless... I died with you unless I really died to this awful self of mine. There can be no life. And I remember then just hanging on to the cross and saying, God, nail me there too, because this has to die. And as that happened, I fell asleep. Very strangely, the next morning when I woke up, as I heard my daughter play terribly again, the rage had left. But of course, the damage was still there. My daughter doesn't play the piano anymore. Many of us, we damage our loved ones in very terrible ways. But what I discovered was that I had changed, that somewhere in that death, a new life had come. That a certain calmness, a certain love, a genuine love had come, and I discovered that there was life. But this wasn't the only experience, because I saw it happen in others too. I was ministering to a death row um, prisoner and he had, one of his things, struggles was pornography. I mean, when, when he was outside, he, it wasn't just pornography, he was just having affairs with women after a woman, sexual affairs and all that. And then he became a Christian and he said, this is wrong, I shouldn't be doing this. But he said, even when I can't even think about the women, they would appear in dreams, they would appear before my eyes. Day and night, I would think of all the women that I've slept with and how all the sexual encounters that I've had. I cannot stop it. I wish I could. And then he turned to me and said, Pastor, how? What can I do? And I looked at him and I scratched my head and I said, oh boy, I don't know. Then I said, why don't you just ask God lah? I mean, that's the only solution I can think of. Ask God to take it from you. A week after, I, later, I visited him. And this man said, you know, I was so desperate. I told God, God, you rub it off my head. Erase all these th thoughts. Give me amnesia. And you know what? He said, like a blackboard eraser, God just erased all my, all my es escapades. I tried to think of them and nothing came back. It was just blank. And I had other thoughts, good thoughts. Then he said, but then I have another problem. At night, I still dream. I can't control. I can control the daytime. I can't control the nighttime. And he said, well, pastor, how? I said, well, I've never heard of this such a thing where God can wipe your mind clean. But if it can happen at daytime, surely God can make it happen at night. So you tell God, lah. daytime, you help me already, now wipe it off in the night. And the next week, I visited and said, you know what, Pastor? God cleaned it off the night, at night as well. And now it's all gone. And then I said, well, okay. And then I rushed home, went on my knees and said, God, you do to him, do to me what you did to him. 
But you know, there is a reality in death. A reality of us acknowledging our death and God bringing life to us. And it has to happen not just once off, but a daily event as we understand the gravity of our sin, whatever that sin is, as we understand how we hurt others, how we damage ourselves, how we are a cesspool of sin. And that's when we start saying, God, take away my sin. Let me die that I may live. And so the passage here says, He died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves. No longer do I think for myself what I want to do and what I want to get because I owe my life to God. But it is not that owing, you know, like, oh yeah, no choice. You bought me, I, I give to you. But it is a life of genuine gratitude that I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That once I was dead, but now I am awake, alive. It is saying to God, God, here am I. I belong to you because you saved my life. It is that life of gratitude that is the motivation for a change in lifestyle. Another death row story, which I might have told you before, I told the youth before, was about a man also in death row who, whom God lifted out from all sorts of problems of depression, of fear, and brought joy. And one day his gang boss asked, sent a message to him asking him, who betrayed you that I might take revenge against them? And his answer to that boss so sincere and honest, it no longer matters who betrayed me. It matters only who saved my life. Here was gratitude. Here was a man who had experienced so much of God that all that matters is God who loved him and cared for him. But that is what dying and living for Christ is all about. It's living without the guardrails. It's living genuinely because we know that we owe it all to God and God alone. I know that many of you have experiences like these too. Experiences when you have called out to God and God has lifted you out. When you have said, God, I can no longer live the way I live. God, help me now. Give me true life. So our motivation is that when we live, we live for Christ. But you know, living for Christ and living in love makes us live rather differently. Next slide, please. Marching to a different beat. Verse 16, it says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What Paul is saying is that we no longer look at people from a fleshly, from, a not, from what we call a usual, common way of looking at people. We look at each one differently. First is how we see people, and secondly is how people have begun to change. And therefore, we see each other differently. We start with Jesus. You know that Jesus was never, ever conventional. The Romans called him a fool. If you're really God, why would you give your life for a sinner? Why would you go to care for the worst of sinners? Why would you lift up someone who is, has a leprosy, who has skin problems? Why would you lift up a prostitute who has sinned so badly, who has so much shame? Why would you go for a cheat, a liar, a tax collector? Why would you sit with them and care for them, you who are God? You surely are a fool. But the Jews too saw him as a blasphemer. They saw him as one who claimed to be God, but Jesus claimed to be God only for their sakes, to let them know that he was here to help them. But they saw him as a blasphemer. How can a carpenter's son be God? So lowly, he's got little education, he's got nothing. How can he even claim to be God? And yet Jesus, out of love, did what he did. 
and he marched to the beat of a different drum. You know, every Christian who's transformed by God, who owes his or her life to God, marches to the beat of a different drum. Each of us is a different person. We are a new creation. <clears throat> you know, often we look at people this way. We look at the past. We look at how bad they were, the history. You've done this and you've done that and you're just a horrible person. Or we look at another person. You're so respectable. You've done such good things. You are so highly qualified. You're, you're just a high achiever and a wonderful person. And we look at pers- people like this with the eyes of what we call the flesh. We respect people because of what they look like. But the people who, whose lives are owed to God, the people whose lives are lived for Jesus, march to the beat of a different drum. They do differently. Because their motivation is love, not respectability, not what looks good, but it is what I'll do if I were loving you. And that's what makes all the difference. And once again, I've seen and I've heard stories and I've experienced these things again. And so these are not just theories, they're real. I went to a church called in Kentucky where I was studying called The Rock, La Roca. It, was, it used to be a very high church, um, middle class, upper middle class, all the big shots were worshipping there. But along the way came the Hispanics uh, because of social demographic changes, um, uh, Hispanics started coming to the town and coming to the, vill- to the church as well. The Hispanics were largely poor people, not respectable the way the whites were. They started occupying the church. So at first things went well, you know, it's like an English-Chinese service kind of thing. The only difference was that the Hispanics and the whites behaved very differently. The whites were high church. They loved quiet in the church. You know, you come to church, you spend 10 minutes in quiet, worshipping, and then after that you stand up and you sing. The Hispanics were gregarious people. To them, church was not just worshipping God. Church was fellowship. You come to church to find out how your, your friends were last week. And so they would gather around waiting for their turn and they'll be chatting away, Hey man, great to see you, man. While the whites were quietly trying to concentrate, the the Hispanics were having a great time greeting each other. But that wasn't all the differences. The whites were clean. They were very, very clean. The toilets were kept spotless. They made sure that the janitors would clean all the toilets. You could sleep in the toilet. The Hispanics, on the other hand, thought, toilet is toilet. Where have we ever heard of a clean toilet? And so they messed up the toilets. Little things like that grated on each other. And finally, the church leadership gathered to discuss how to split the church. Hispanics one side, whites one side. But before they even decided to split, they had a whole list of complaints against each other. The whites had a very long list of how bad the Hispanics were. The Hispanics also had a list of how how haughty and arrogant the whites were. And they came with the list. And as they sat down, suddenly the Holy Spirit came upon them. And instead of attacking each other, suddenly they saw the other the way God saw each of them. They broke down. The first one, I don't know whether it was the Hispanic or the white, went to the other side and said, I'm sorry, but God loves you. I can't say anything more than that. And the other side, they did the same. And then they embraced. The church that emerged from that was a very different church altogether. It was a church that opened its doors to anyone who would come. Thieves, robbers, anyone. In fact, it was so bad that they had to have offering plate in front so that people would put money in front rather than having the offering bag. Because every time the offering bag went around, it would come back empty. Someone else would have dipped their hands in and helped themselves to the offering. But that was all right for them. They said, this is a place where God loves people. One day, even the entire drum set was taken away between two services. But for them, it was, this is the house of God, a God who loves his people. And it became a very special church. 
But people who know God, who live for God, who have been touched by God, live very differently. Because it is the love of Christ that controls them. And therefore, we no longer see each other as, oh, that's a thief, that's a prostitute, that's a, ho- that's a horrible person, this is a good person. But we see people from the eyes of God, and therefore we see no longer out of flesh, but that everyone is a new creation or potential new creation. But you know, this happens to us as individuals as well. I was sharing the story about my rage. That was a bad story. Now let me tell you a good story. I had a, I had a huge grudge against one of my pastor bosses. The ones, you know, right on top. I felt that he was making terrible decisions. You can't identify him. That was many years ago, but really couldn't stand that guy. felt that he was biased. He was um, haughty. He was arrogant. He victimized me and everything else. One day as I was sitting at a conference and I was, as, as expected, very indifferent. You know, I sat cross-legged looking at him. Hi, hey, talking rubbish. Let him continue. Let him continue. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit said to me, Ming Li, go and say sorry to him. And I said, God, no such thing. <laughs> go say sorry. Then, Holy Spirit again said, Ming Li, go say sorry to him. And I said, he's busy. La. He's busy talking. At the break, say sorry. I said, at the break, lots of people will be gathering around him. And God said, just wait. and Say sorry when the turn comes. And then the break came and I was expecting him to be surrounded by lots of his admirers and the people who were going to talk to him. But instead, he stood alone and then the Holy Spirit said, now, go say sorry. It was just undoable, unthinkable, unimaginable. But because the love of Christ was in control, I said, God, I got nothing to say. I went up and I said, I'm sorry, sir, for all that I've thought of you and all that I've done to you. We embraced. But you know, these things never, ever happen in ordinary days ordinary times when we try to have guardrails. With the guardrails, I would simply have said, I can always think whatever I want about him. He wouldn't know until I let him know. But because it was the love of Christ that fills us, that controls our lives, we do things that we usually will not do. Because when God's love comes to our hearts, it changes us. But it's not just these special things. It's also in the day-to-day things that happens to us. Yesterday, I was at the prayer meeting, and then we were gathering to groups of four. And so at one point, we were asked, what are your prayer requests? So it came to me, and I said, oh, my prayer requests, I'm just desperate. I haven't, I haven't got a single thought in my mind about the sermon tomorrow. I'm dead meat. And then, to my surprise, they laid hands on me and they started praying sincerely. But that wasn't the end of it. I mean, I felt so loved already that people would lay their hands on me and pray. It wasn't the end of it. Because late at night, and I only found out early this morning when I woke up, someone had written, he had sent me an article about the passage that I was about to preach. He had given me in point form all his thoughts about that, that passage. And one would have thought that he was a theologian. Well, he was the kind of nondescript person. When we started to pray, he started by saying, hey, I'm so sorry, I don't know how to pray. No theologian at all. And then he wrote, after all the tips about the sermon, which, by the way, are part of this sermon. And he said, so sorry. I hope you're not offended by my write-up just wanting to help in any way as I can, see how short a time you are having. I really pray that they are somehow helpful and God inspires you with some more things to share with the congregation. Pray that God will be with you and everything will be perfect. I'm so sorry that I will not be there to give you support as I'm working tomorrow. 
God bless and be with you. Most unnecessary, one might think, from a guy who doesn't know how to pray to write to a pastor with sermon points. And yet the love of God constrained him. The love of God guided him to give me the sermon points part of the sermon for today. It is supernatural in one sense. And yet it is things that we often will not do. But when God controls your life, when the love of Christ controls our lives, He gives us supernatural courage, He gives us wisdom, He gives us an ability to want to make a move, to do something. There are more stories, but God works in each of our lives, transforming us so that it's no longer the guardrails that are relevant. It is the inner self that is being transformed day by day. And finally then, the third point. We have been called God's ambassadors, pleading on God's behalf to be reconciled. Have you ever wondered what it is? God pleading with us? In verse 26, it says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The word implore simply means we beg you. We beg you to be on behalf of God, to be reconciled to God. Think about it. We are often the ones who need to say, God, I plead with you, have mercy on me. God, I plead with you, do not leave me. God, I beg you, come to me. But here it is, God saying, I beg of each of you, come back to me. But why should this be? Why should this be unusual? Why should this even be unexpected? When God would send his son, the sinless one, to die to take our sin upon himself. You know, if I had one child who was alone sinless among a million, that's one chance, last chance. Why would I give the sinless person to become sin and then risk having all the others become sin as well, remain sinful? It was a huge gamble from God that His only beloved Son who had never failed before would take the failings of everyone else on Himself. That we might come to God be seen as righteous. Crazy thing to do. But that's the extent of the love of God our Father. Not just sitting there in judgment and saying, well, you did good today, you did bad today. But a God who would do everything and then say to us, it's all been done, you have been forgiven. Now please, I beg you, come, be reconciled with me. But that's the message that all of us have been given. To plead on behalf of God, be reconciled with God. And that's what evangelism is all about. It's just not about making this congregation bigger and saying, let's fill all these seats. It's not about getting more people to join us. It is about realizing that God desperately wants each person to come to know that He loves them and to be transformed to be controlled by His love for them. And God does put that in our hearts. It is not this thing about, I want more heads, I want more people to be Christian alone. It is a compassion inside our hearts. Last week, I, um, I conducted a funeral service for this gentleman who had passed away. He was a prisoner for many years and extra addict and all that. He was introduced to me by our Chinese pastor, Anthony. And so Heidi and myself and three of us would go down to visit him. But this man had become a Christian and there was so much joy in him. But you know, when we started singing, playing the guitar and singing, this chap just couldn't stop. You know, he was terminally ill, very bad. His stomach was huge, so bloated. We knew that his time was up. He still had a sense of humor. He said, well, my, his tattoo, you know, my little leopard has now grown to be an adult leopard. But it was a very sad observation because that was how his stomach had bloated up. And we knew that he probably had a week or two weeks left. 
But as we sang about God holding our hands and God loving him, he was just so filled with joy. But you know, as, we, as he passed, and then he passed away a few days later, so I did the funeral as I sat and looked at the family. I just sensed God saying how I long for each one to come to know me the way he has come to know me. How I long for them to have that peace instead of the fear. How I long for these who have loved this man to have come to me. But that's the way God is longingly looking at each person and saying, I wish they would come back to me. Well, the good news is that today the sister and her husband came to our um, Chinese service. and Maybe that's just the start. But knowing the heart of God for each person, it's not for select few. It says all have died and therefore God gave his life for all. God's longing is for every person. And you know, it doesn't depend so much on us to show, uh, to show how earnest God is in people coming. He doesn't just say, okay, you go do the work. He actually brings opportunities for us. Last Friday, I received a, a text, very excited. It was Friday night, late at night, and this text from a very excited friend who said something great has come to us as a climax for a whole week. You see, this friend of mine, um, earlier in the morning had received a flyer for a seminar on um, spiritual God speaking to dementia patients. But the funny thing was that this flyer had reached her two hours after the seminar had started. And so she was like scratching her head. What, what stupid? Send me a flyer after the seminar is over. Anyway, as she read the flyer, she thought of a friend who was a social worker working with dementia patients. So she just called her for fun and said, Hey, um, are you at the seminar? And then this friend who was an atheist, um, who loved the elderly, and whom my friend had been trying to reach for a long time but did not know how to start a conversation, this friend said, you know, I'm attending this very exciting seminar. Speakers are telling me how God speaks to those with dementia. And that began a conversation about God and how God loves people and how God reaches and a friend of mine was so excited because she said, I've been hoping to tell, talk to her about my friend, about God. And suddenly, God presents this crazy situation where I receive a flyer that is after the event that prompted me to call her and then we start a conversation about God. But this is a, something that happens to us very often if we were aware of it. That God just doesn't leave us to say, okay, you're going to reach 10 people next week. But God gives us opportunities, creates. Why? Because God so desperately wants each person to come back to Him, to know that He loves them, that He wants to live in their lives and transform their lives. God is not inactive. He doesn't sit there and do nothing. He goes about doing the work but he calls us to respond to him as he leads us. And so, conclusion. What then? First of all, we have to acknowledge that we are dead without him. There are lots of things about us that we hide, we rationalize, we push under the carpet. But we've got to recognize that we are destructive beings, we are sinful beings without God. And it is only God who will give us life. God is life-giving, will teach us how to love. Secondly then, Holy Spirit, God must live in us. The love of Christ must control our lives. And it is in controlling our lives that we live differently, differently from what we would normally live. That we will live as people who love God and love others. And finally, recognize that God wants others to know him. So when we see another person, allow first the love of God to fill us, to feel for that person, want that person to know God. Don't do it mechanically. It doesn't work mechanically. 
But first have compassion for the people that you see. Some of you will be going this, eve- this afternoon to deliver food packages to the neighbourhood. As you do so, pray. Pray that God will put compassion in your hearts to see how much God loves them. And as you see how much God loves them, to respond in love to the families. Let us pray. Father, how much you love each of us. But God, we, we often don't recognize this. We see you as sometimes like a bank account, like Santa Claus, like someone who answers our prayers and that's it. But we really don't know how much you have loved us and how much you will transform our lives, how different our lives can be if we allowed your love to change us and your love to control our lives. And so, God, we place ourselves before you. We say, Lord, we belong to you. Help us to live as your beloved children. Then, Lord, you help us to see the opportunities where you long to bring people to yourself, back home to yourself. And then you send us forth. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Just let's rise as we worship the Lord. God here, God 
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and always. Amen. Please take your seats. God bless you. And join us all for lunch after this.